I'm excited to welcome onto the podcast, Dr. Christian Bush. Christian, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Um, hey, I often hear a lot, uh, social media, I read about it, that phrase, hope is not a strategy. And when you see a book like The Serendipity Mindset, that quote might leap to your mind, but I want to share with listeners, you talk about the difference between blind luck and smart luck. Can you share that differentiation with us? Yeah, absolutely. So it's really about this idea that, you know, over the last 10-ish years, we've worked a lot on that question of what makes people truly successful in their life? What makes a CEO a CEO? What is it that makes them a little bit more successful than others? And one of the key themes that's coming out of it is that they're extremely good at cultivating serendipity, this kind of smart luck that comes from seeing a little bit more in unexpected moments and then turning them into unexpected positive outcomes. And so very different from the kind of blind luck, right? Where you're born into a nice family, stuff like that we can't really pick. And so I've been really fascinated by that question of how do we cultivate that smart luck, that serendipity? And, you know, take an example. Imagine you have uh, erratic hand movements like I do and you spill a lot of coffee. So imagine you're in a coffee shop and you spill coffee over someone, accidentally so, and they look at you slightly annoyedly, but you, you sense there might be something there. You don't know what it is. You just sense there might be something there. And now you have a couple of options, right? One option being you just say, I'm so sorry. Here's a napkin. You walk outside and you think, ah, what could have happened had I spoken with that person? Option two, you start that conversation. You apologize. You, you, you kind of get into that conversation. And it turns out that person becomes the love of your life or your co-founder or your next business partner. And so the idea really is that depending on our reaction to the unexpected, that kind of shapes a lot of what's actually coming out of the unexpected. I love it. I mean, when I saw your book, I think I think we've got a mutual connection, Dory Clark, and I think she kind of commented on your post and I was like, what is this book? And the second I saw that, I downloaded it because uh, it's funny, Christian, originally this podcast, I was going to call it Go Luck Yourself, which is kind of <laughs> aggressive. <laughs> But there's actually a book about uh, that already. Um, I get. A, I have a question. So I, I think I have a serendipity mindset and that often leads to FOMO because I feel like I should be going to every single event and like constantly putting myself out there. How do you balance the FOMO with cultivating the serendipity in your life? Yeah, I, I'm completely with you. I, I'm the same. <laughs> and I think that's that's always the interesting thing. I think when you intuitively cultivate serendipity, you have that a lot also, right? That you're like, oh my God, how do I not get distracted by having so much of, of that kind of serendipity happen? And so I'm, I'm a huge fan of really thinking about what are some filters in our life that help us understand what's truly meaningful to us? So for example, um, you know, do we have some key curiosity we want to explore at this point and can we select events based on that curiosity? Or is there a particular theme that we're really interested in at the moment that we can build into conversations to then kind of, you know, after and after, dive into those communities that are more related to that. And so uh, I'm a big fan in that regard, actually, of the hook strategy um, that we can use in any community we're in, but that leads us towards those that in a way could be most exciting for us. And so the hook strategy is really about saying, how do we use every conversation to see the couple of the things we're curious about, the couple of the interests we're we have at the moment to then have people pick up on this and say, oh my God, you know, let me connect you to this person, to this idea. And so what that means is, you know, someone who does that really good is Ollie Barrett, who's an entrepreneur in London. And if you would ask Ollie, you know, the dreaded, what do you do question or have a conversation with him, he wouldn't just say, I'm a education entrepreneur. Or so he would say, I'm in education, recently started reading into the philosophy of science, but what I'm really excited about is playing the piano. And so what he's doing here is he's giving you three potential hooks where you could be like, oh my God, such a coincidence. We're hosting piano sessions, do stop by. Oh my God, such a coincidence. Uh, my sister is teaching on the philosophy of science. You should give a guest lecture. The point is that I'm a big fan of really reflecting on what are some of these key curiosities we have and then really building them into every conversation that then leads us to those kind of more relevant events to us that, that might feel truly relevant at the moment. Oh, I love it. That's because I always sort of freak out when anyone asks me, what do you do? Because I, I kind of resist being labeled by one thing. And it's like, well, what, what have I been doing today? Like, I, I just list the most recent thing. So the fact that you can sort of give, if, you know, that context is actually really reassuring. Um, I mean, I think podcasting is also a bit of serendipity as well, just having a podcast. Like you can record content and then six months later, someone will pick it up, it resonates, and then you know, you might get a client or something's happened in their life. Uh, with your book, I mean, uh, let's take this quite meta. Has there anything sort of serendipitous happened to you since publishing a book about serendipity? Well, I, I've been really surprised by how 
the concept you know resonates with people in in in, in different ways than i expect i always thought that you know, great, like I'm writing this book um, uh, for people who have a lot of serendipity in their life and it gives them a language for it, a vocabulary. It, it gives them an opportunity. You know, if you're a CEO of a company, you don't want to be in the boardroom and say, oh, I just had something unexpected happen and then I just ran with it. That sounds very passive. That sounds like you're out of control, right? like like not in control. But, but, but if you can say, no, I consciously cultivated serendipity here. I created a culture that allows us to have that kind of innovation happen that was unexpected, but you know we had a culture that allowed for it to emerge. That actually sounds like you're in control. And so I first thought, well, I write that book for people like what sounds like yourself, who in a way have serendipity in their life, and this, this gives us them a way to articulate it, to legitimize it, and, and to then also share it with other people who might not intuitively do it. But then what I realized is there were all these people. You know, I had psychologists, for example, reach out and say, "Oh my God, this is a way for us to help uh, patients with their anxiety because." The unexpected usually is the threat. It's the thing that makes us really nervous. But now that we can look at the unexpected also as a source of joy, of meaning, then you can reframe that towards something that actually can be a source of something positive rather than negative. Or, you know, the parents of an autistic son who would say, oh, my God, now that, you know, we were stuck with um, the, the kid at home because, you know, COVID shut everything down. But now this gave us a way to develop meaningful relationship with, with them that we didn't before because we ask questions differently and we focus on different things and, and we focus on the meaning in this. And to me, that's really kind of the, the deeper, you know, philosophical side behind this that serendipity is about potentiality. It's about finding what is it in that situation that we can still do so that when we connect the dots, it, it makes something. And I think that's kind of the relational aspect that I had underestimated, but that actually, I think, for a lot of people is is the deepest kind of um, thing that they take away from it. Yeah, that, that's so cool that that audience has, has tapped into it. It kind of reminds me, I was in, so my business coach is Alan Weiss and we were in Hawaii recently. And he's, cause I, again, back to me being labeled, I hate it. I hate having to say I'm a whatever. Um, and he was saying, well, what if you can be, what if you don't need clarity? What if you can thrive in ambiguity? Isn't that better? And I was like, that is such a nice positive reframe on, on that. But like what I was seeing as a potential threat was actually a really good thing. Um, there's a good David White quote, and he says, that which you can plan is too small for you to live. And I, I just think about that when it comes to like, think about planning your business and strategy and things like that. You, you alluded to the CEO earlier. So Christian, how do you balance uh, building your business, putting out a book, doing, you're very prolific in, in what you do. I mean, is that a lot of that planned? Is it serendipity? What's the combination that works best for you? Well, one thing that, that I've, I've, found very useful and that I've learned from from people I had the pleasure to research on and, and to, to learn from is that that idea of trying to find some kind of North Star in terms of saying, hey, you know, what's truly meaningful to me and my, you know, for me at the moment is to say, how do I take that mindset into as many hearts and minds as I can? And so that's kind of in a way a sense of direction. And then everything that comes my way that fits into this, I'm like, yay, great, serendipity, let's plug it in. And everything that doesn't really fit into it, I'm like, hey, great, Here's a Google Doc parking lot. I'll put it on here, and then later on I'll reevaluate and, and and take it there. And so it, it, it in a way is is an additional filter that helps to say, okay, this this really makes sense. And um, you know, the, the, I found that really interesting. So we did a study with um, over forty of the world's um, most successful CEOs, where we sat them down. We said, what is it that truly makes you successful? And one of the key themes that came out of it is that they're extremely good at saying, here's a certain whatever it is, purpose, sense of direction, North Star. Uh, if we're MasterCard, we want to bring 500 million people into the financial system. That's where we want to go. Here's a strategy. But I'm telling you already now that if some unexpected information comes, we will adjust the strategy. And that's not a threat. That's part of the plan. And, and I've always tried to learn from that in terms of saying, how can I have that sense of where I'm going? Here's a strategy. I'm, I'm, I'm German. I love planning. I love kind of making a schedule and everything else. But then I'm open to that idea of, hey, I always thought I would take the book into bookstores, but COVID happened. So, hey, maybe it's even better if I can do it online now because it can be more global and I can be in Australia like this, right, in, in, in your living room, um, yeah. um, uh, which, you know, that private plane, I wouldn't have had it before, right? I can't afford a private plane, but I can, 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 can afford the private Zoom plane. And so it's those kind of things where um, I've become a big, big fan of to say, let's try to figure out you know, what's the sense of direction? Or I think there's a lot of pressure on people, you know, to find their purpose, their passion, all that stuff. 
I, I'm a big fan of trying to find one's curiosity. Like, what am I curious about? What am I, in, am I interested in? That takes the pressure off a little bit of trying to figure it all out now. And then based on that curiosity, serendipity starts to happen. And then you come closer to that purpose, passion, or, or meaningful impact oh that one might have. That is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, yeah, I guess a lot of people do. I mean, again, myself, I say a lot of people, but I'm just talking N equals one, me, uh, <laughs> talking about uh, the purpose and, the, and you know, what is the driver behind this. And it's funny because I often, I, uh, like I've got a list of topics I should write about. And I think I've curated that over a couple of years. And I, I go back to that list and I think, oh, I should pick one. But I never, when you go back, back, in time, it's like, I'm not curious about that anymore. You really got to sort of land in like, right today, what am I interested in? And then that provides the energy for you to actually sort of get writing and, and put the content out there. Um, and that's the great, yeah. the great point you made, right? In terms of yeah. how you said that in a way plans limit us, right? If you would just say, I want to have 5,000 listeners to my podcast within the first month, like, you know, it's great to have that milestone, but but why would you limit yourself to that if, you know, you run into an amazing person who can help you do more of that or, you know, whatever it is, I think that idea that, that a plan is great for having an idea of where we're going, but then, you know, that openness to saying, you know what, maybe there's an even better way to do it. Uh, someone actually, I, I always remember, um, I, I had that amazing mentor, um, or still have him, fortunately, and, and he used to say, Christian, people like you always think there's only one way to roam. Uh, the city and then you realize you know you don't even want to be in Rome and I think that kind of to me always was that idea that it's great to have a plan but you know what maybe you don't even want to be there or there's a better way to to get there yeah and I think um you spoke before just about Germany and like it is one of my favorite countries I went to the World Cup in 2006 and camped all around and followed the Australian football team and I just loved I mean loved the efficiency of the place like everything was on time everything was like it was easy <laughs> to travel around um and you you talk about uh, even just cultivating serendipity daily in your life is like maybe taking a different road to work instead of the usual road, maybe trying a different coffee shop, like just these little things that we can do that sort of uh, interrupt the patterns of our day. What other things do you suggest uh, that we can do to, to sort of bring serendipity as a mindset into the way that we live every day? I'm a big fan of, of, of thinking about every situation we're in as, as a growth opportunity and really thinking about, okay, if I'm in a coffee shop and I, that kind of, you know, the, I, I have a plate in my hand and that plate drops, you know, like the usual reaction would be like, oh my God, that's embarrassing. Oh my God, let me clean this up as soon as possible. But it's always amazing how quickly there's self-selection of those people who will help, who come to you and help. And then those people, the, the kind of conversations I've had with people who, with my kind of, you know, slightly eclectic hand movements, I've broken <laughs> a lot of stuff. But I can tell you some of my most amazing conversations come from those people who then help me. That's kind of almost self-selecting the kind of people I want to spend time with. And then you have that conversation, you joke about it, and then you build that relationship with that person. So the point being that in any situation, the car breaking down when we go on holidays and, you know, now the holiday could be over because we're like, oh my God, like, you know, we blow up or we kind of like use that as a bonding experience because the first time that the family actually is in one place together and they can't escape and they can't be on their phones, whatever it is, it's kind of that thing of like trying to figure out, can I, whatever the situation is, especially if it seems like a crisis, is there some meaning in this? And you know, I've always been a big fan of, of Viktor Frankl, who, you know, he faced the toughest situation you can imagine. He was in a concentration camp. He, there's objectively no hope. There's, there's nothing there. But he said, you know what, I will subjectively create meaning. There's no objective meaning, but subjectively I will create it. And so he said, you know what, I will still write that book when I get out of here. So I have a bigger purpose, like once I get out here, but also I will still speak to prisoners every day and, and make them feel better. And by doing this, I now have a reason to wake up tomorrow morning because I still have to speak to so many other people uh, to make them feel better. And so I think I'm a big fan of trying to figure out, is there some, even if objectively it seems meaningless, the situation, is there a subjective meaning I can attach to it uh, to do it? And what's amazing then is you start to connect the dots differently. You start to, to feel, oh my God, this broken glass here, actually that person I just caught up with, you know, maybe that's kind of the next X, Y, Z to me and, and whatever it is. And so I think I'm a big fan of those kind of very simple things, but but they, they add so much joy and meaning to our life because then any accident in a way becomes the opportunity as an inflection point to something interesting. Yeah, and actually very topical at the moment. There's so many missed flights and delayed flights at the moment. So if you're <laughs> listening to this, take it as a sign that 
look at the person next to you that you're waiting with, <laughs> maybe strike up a conversation. Hey, my husband's particularly good at this. I, I think people would look at us and I think I'm, I'm the extrovert, but really he is like anytime we go traveling or even at the dog park, he's the one that's just, he's just striking up conversations with all these people. And I'm like, sometimes I think, gosh, I talk for a living. I just want to like, not, <laughs> not be out there. And I don't know, like when introverts hear this about, oh, now I should get out and start talking. Like what advice do you have for them in terms of cultivating their serendipity, maybe not through conversations or I'm not too sure. Yeah. Curious yeah. around your thoughts on that. Oh, absolutely. That, that's a topic very close to my heart. I mean, I'm one of those kind of closet introverts who I seem very extroverted. People always assume I'm extroverted, but you know, no problem giving a speech or a podcast, but then I need time to replenish and, and you know, like get energy from, from quiet sources. And so I've been thinking a lot about how do you work with extroverts so that they can do a little bit of that, that you don't enjoy too much. So for example, um, when a book comes out, like, you know, um, and there's a dinner party, my first thought goes to, okay, can I first talk with a host who's hosting? Can I get them excited about the book so that when they do the introduction or when they talk with people, they essentially spread the idea so I don't have to do it or things like that, where it's almost kind of like thinking about how can the extrovert use their superpowers um, and, and I don't have to do that in, in that particular moment. So that, that applies to any situation, right? An insurance broker who goes to a school, like trying to figure out who's the person here, who's the multiplier, who's the person who knows everyone and who everyone trusts. If I can convince that one person, they will talk with everyone else. They anyways more trustable and, and credible than I am uh, in, in that particular context. And so it's really um, those kind of things that I found useful to think about how can we leverage the superpowers of extroverts. But then also, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of serendipity from quiet sources, from calm sources, right? Um, one of the superpowers of, of people who are more introverted is to um, be very reflective often, right? So to really kind of um, maybe help the extrovert to make sense out of something they've experienced or to read a book and think, oh my God, that could be a movie. Um, things like that, where you connect the dots from quiet sources. Or thirdly, really thinking about also, and, and, and that's something that's thinking about what is my comfort zone and, and what can I do to, to push that a little bit? So for example, to your point, right? Um, there, there's not that much difference when you get that, what do you do question anyways, at an event where you have to go to to just cast a couple of hooks and just try out what feels authentic. And that might feel like a step at the beginning, but actually it becomes easier and easier. And then it feels, you know, um, hey, that might actually be uh, even enjoyable. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks for sharing those tips. are very pragmatic in terms of what someone can do. And even just some, um, as you say that, just changing your hook. I, I mean, I might even just change my LinkedIn tagline just for fun <clears throat> because it's it's digital it's not permanent I can change it back tomorrow <laughs> we'll see we'll see how that goes uh you talk about so I guess part of the extrovert introvert thing is where you get your energy from and, and in your book you get you told me something and I well you wrote it down obviously I heard it now I've started implementing it because I'd often uh I'd, I'd actually schedule my meetings when I was you know, around the like 10 a.m., 11 a.m. time, but I wasn't getting enough deep work in the morning. And you recommend people shifting their meetings and things to the afternoon. Can you share your insight on that um, and why it's been helpful? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really based on this idea of maker versus manager schedule or um, so, so essentially when are you doing work that's conceptual? So that's something that you have to, to go deeply into, right? So in my case, when I'm writing a paper or when I'm doing a strategic plan, I need a couple of hours for that where I don't want to be interrupted because otherwise it takes me out of it and it takes me a long time to get back into it. So I'm trying to schedule that in times where I have high energy, which usually is the mornings, um, but also then kind of where I know that people might not interrupt me because I block that time and I, I try to, to, to keep that kind of as a private meeting. Then I'm literally in the schedule. It's a meeting with myself um, that, that I have at that point. Um, versus then in the afternoon, maybe more of the manager things in terms of meeting, meeting, meeting. And then it's very easy to have a, a quick coffee with someone, right? Because it's only the time of the coffee or the call versus the time that, that takes me back and forth between the, the things. But I think uh, to your point, what I found most interesting is to try to figure out when do I have energy? Like when, is, when do I have the most creative energy? And then focusing that time on the things that I feel create the most value. So for example, when writing the book, when I was writing the book, I was trying to figure out, okay, if I have most energy in the morning, then I want to protect that time for writing the book at that particular time. And then everything else I would try to get in the afternoon or at night. Um, and, and so I'm a big fan of really figuring out when do I have peak energy? And then what are the tasks where that can help me the most 
and, and then really kind of trying to schedule around this. I know that a lot of us might not have the kind of control over our time as much. That's, by the way, one of the, the beautiful things of COVID, right? When you're working from home and you can, you can be a bit more flexible of how you work when and, and, and where, um, there I'm a huge fan of trying to then schedule people into slots where it doesn't interfere with your deep work. That's awesome. And I think the last you point around, you just need to be sure, like, what is your true north? And obviously for you, the books, so then you dedicate that time and put the deep work time in. But without that sort of criteria, you just be, your calendar is open for anything, really. I've got a question here from Antonio. And he uh, he wrote, is there a correlation between an abundance mindset and the occurrence of serendipity? In my experience, they do happen more often. One cannot control them, but the inner place leads to astounding levels of serendipity. I don't know if that's I, a question or a comment. <laughs> I, I absolutely love that question. Thank you so much. Because mm. so a lot of my work is in, in context of extreme resource constraints. So especially in Kenya, South Africa, um, in, 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 in some parts of the countries where, where there's extreme poverty. And I will never forget the first thing. So I started working there around 10 years ago. And I went to an organization there, a social enterprise that's fantastic. They do low cost education methodology um, and help people kind of gain education and things like, you know, uh, using social media to build a business, like very easy things like this. And I went there and I asked them, what is the one thing I, as the person coming into your context, should never ask you? And every kind of white do-gooder who comes into your context always asks, but I, I just shouldn't because you find that. You know. and, and, and they said, well, never ask us first what we need, because if you ask us first what we need, you put us in the role of the victim, the beneficiary, someone who needs your benevolence. But if you come in and say, what's already here and how can we make the best of it? then we can start on the same level and then we can still talk about resourcing later on. And so what they do is when they go into different poverty contexts and, and work with communities who are similarly poor, they go in and they say, what's already here and how can we make the best of it? There's a former drug dealer, fantastic. That person will have a lot of creative energy. They will have amazing social capital, so a lot of connections. And if we can turn them into a teacher, you can turn the community around. And they look at an old training center and they, uh, they look at an old garage and they see a potential training center. And so that mindset of thinking about how can I make the best of what is at hand? How can I feel that kind of abundance in terms of social capital, human capital, whatever is around, and then kind of think about that first. It's amazing how people then are extremely creative around this. And then later on, we can still think about how do we need something different? And the reason I, I, I love that question is because if you think about sim something simple like a budgeting thing, right? So when they do budgeting, right? The usual approach in budgeting is you say, I wanna have an event with um, 20 people, so I need 20 chairs. So let me put into the budget, I need 20 chairs for the event because we don't have chairs here. Now, what, what this organization, our labs, Reconstructed Living Labs would do is they would say, you know what, do you really need the chairs or can people stand or can, can, can they do other things? If they really need the chairs, is there someone around you who can provide the chairs? Is there a restaurant next door that can borrow you the chairs? Is there a neighbor that has a lot of chairs? Whatever it is. And only if you can answer all these questions with a no, then you get the budget. The point here is that what they are saying essentially is there's more abundance in the moment and in the situation than we see because we're so used to resourcing. We're so used to asking for kind of additional resources. But once you look at a situation or more importantly, a person with what could be then you make them capable of actually getting there. And, and that's kind of from a philosophical perspective, you know, very long answer to a very short question, but I'm a huge fan of Goethe. And Goethe had this beautiful idea to take someone as they are, you make them worse. But if you take them as what they could be, you make them capable of becoming what they can be. And so this idea that we look at a person or a situation as what could be, that kind of potentiality, that a lot of times then enables them to say, oh, wow, I could potentially get somewhere and I, I, I could be there versus kind of like, if you look at a former drug dealer and you just see a former drug dealer, they will always stay a former drug dealer. And that's what I think um, a resume, I, I heard this quote kind of links into to this. I think it was Julie, Julie uh, Clow. She said, a resume is just a list of things you don't want to do anymore. <laughs> oh, but, and yeah, it's like looking at people as they are, but what, what is the potential as well? Uh, and also reminds me of um, something I've been thinking about lately, having a results list versus a to-do list. And again, Alan sort of shared with me, he was, he had on his list, uh, clean the pool today. I thought, no, what's the result I'm after? I'm after a result, and that is I want to create a welcoming experience for my 4th of July party. And if you think mm -hmm. about that, then it's like, okay, the pool needs to be clean, but what, like, what, how can we get assistance here? How can we create that feeling, that environment? And it, so then I shifted my list. I had to run a workshop the other day, and rather than write, you know, deliver a workshop, it was how do I create the most enjoyable, valuable experience for the 10 people that are showing up on my Zoom call? And it's a, 
then you aren't limited by what you think a workshop is. It's like, how do I bring in all these other thoughts and ideas? So um, Antonio, thanks for sharing that question because it's really uh, generated good conversation. Now we'll go to the rapid round as well, just to, to wrap this up. So uh, Christian, what is a book that has shaped the way that you think? And I think you might've mentioned it already on the show. Yeah, it, well, it's definitely Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. I'm rereading it every time I'm in a crisis and it always helps me to, in a way, take perspective and think about, okay, is there still something in here that, that I can do with this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's outstanding. We'll put a link to it. Um, favorite tool or app that you recommend? So favorite? Uh... A tool or an app that you recommend? Oh. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Headspace. I think I think grounding oneself, um, being in the moment is a huge um, thing in terms of if, if you want to do the things that feel truly meaningful. Yeah, great app. Um, what is a song that you either listen to to get you energized or that helps you focus? I've always loved Beautiful Day of U2 just as a kind of, uh, you know, I've, I've somehow grown up with it. I don't know why, but it always gives me a good, a good mood. <laughs> You don't have to rationalize why you love that song. It's a great, it's a great <laughs> song. And is there a quote that you want to share with listeners, a favorite quote of yours? Well, unsurprisingly, so probably of Viktor Frankl, which really is, you know, he had this, um, th this beautiful theme. He never really said it, I think, but, but it's kind of like at the core of his, um, his work is this idea that, that we cannot always control the situation we're in, but we can always control our response to it. And that's where our freedom lies and, and, and in a way our serendipity. And, and to me, that's always meant a lot because, you know, especially when you work in contexts that are extremely rough and, and uh, where people have very tough challenges, they cannot pick them. Um, and then you always see people who try to do something. And I think it, it's extremely inspirational how, how, how even in those contexts you see people who break out of this. And so I'm a big fan of thinking about if we have a privilege that we can create, help create situations, we have to help kind of people, um, you know, level the playing field. And then whatever situation we're individually in, um, is there always something we can still do? Uh, that's very powerful. Thank you so much. Um, Christian, I'm so thrilled that you were on this show and that we're getting to share your exceptional message. And plus the fact that I've got to say, it, it is a book about serendipity. The fact that it's backed by you or you're a researcher, you, you know, like that is actually, it adds credibility to the serendipity uh, way of, of living, of thinking. So thank you so much for that. If our listeners would love to connect with you, uh, where should we send them? Yeah, well, well, thanks so much. And it's great to be here. And it's great to, you know, your fantastic energy and thoughtfulness is, is very much appreciated. And I very much enjoyed the conversation. And uh, in terms of how to best connect, the, the homepage is serendipitymindset.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter at Chris Serendip. Awesome. We'll link to that in the show notes. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.